Tafia to help me and um, invite me to this uh, talk. It is an interesting experience. Although I have been an obstetrician gynecologist for a little while, um, this topic has actually um, helped me to explore further into um, in this um, in this particular scenario, and it's quite interesting. And I welcome you all who have joined me in the evening. So thank you very much. Um, so um, endometriosis, as we all know, uh, let me just move my slide. Yes. It is working a disclaimer a little bit. Um, this has got some picture which has got um, um, the uh, laparoscopic view, what we find. We know that it, there's a big uh, long, some, for some uh, patients, there will be a long journey to getting pregnant. And whether the diagnosis was suspected or had it, has it been confirmed before the pregnancy started, what were their previous treatments? These impacts their um, journey through the pregnancy. Was it a medical treatment with the tablets, with hormonal tablets, or surgical management? And what type of the surgery did you and um, did anyone have um, before they embarked on this um, uh, journey, or actually when they have become pregnant? And has it been diagnosed? I must say, in the literature review, um, the diagnosis during pregnancy. Um, uh, have not either have been underreported or as, and it's it's something that we might have to look forward to explore further. Uh, the first ever diagnosis during pregnancy, otherwise it would normally be um, in the developed countries, at least um, uh, in the Western world, um, it will be usually already diagnosed. We know pregnancy can happen spontaneously in 60 to 70 percent of um, endometriosis uh, of women uh, or those suffering with endometriosis. Um, and it may require assisted conception techniques, assisted reproductive techniques to become pregnant. And this has influence in terms of that how the pregnancy um, carries on. So one may wonder what will happen to the endometriosis when you do get pregnant, and how these endometriotic lesions may behave. So I thought these will be the expectations you uh, and audiences would like to know. Um, and we all know that it would be very multifaceted and it will depend on what type of pregnancy would it be, what is it, natural or um, uh, with assisted reproductive techniques, or is it the first pregnancy or has there been previous pregnancies and what were they like? And what were the previous mode of births? Was it a cesarean section or um, was it a vaginal birth? Um, and could they be um, flared up in pregnancy of this condition? So I hope by the end of this presentation and discussion, we will have some answers to these questions. Um, and uh, how will you be cared for as well? So um, this pregnancy needs to be planned. It is, a, a, and majority of the cases, if it is assisted reproductive techniques, usually they are very well planned and they are very much desired and wanted during this journey. And they may have been actually involved in many other testing and screening um, at the times of when they are planning the pregnancy when the couples are. Um, then there will be something which is general antenatal care, which is for everyone. Um, and then we may have to um, um, tweak their antenatal care according to the needs of the individual. So therefore, therefore, it will require individualized assessment of those um, risk or chances that can happen um, during pregnancy. And I have put in this a generic template where it would be that we will be looking at as healthcare professionals, usually our midwifery colleagues are the first one um, or, or the GP colleagues um, in their surgery who will be booking the pregnancies. And therefore, um, this needs to be detailed and you can help as um, uh, with your history, with your giving effective background. If you had the surgical notes, it's always helpful to take them to your booking in, uh, uh, appointments um, so that the clinicians can um, assess all these needs that what were the symptoms at the moment, what was the impact on your daily living, how is your work affected by it, or what mod modifications and modulations would you want in your um, work environment, what are your priorities during this time, um, your cultural background in terms of what are your specific needs, um, if you need uh, physical needs again, psychosexual or emotional, um, and desire of fertility was when if you were seen in the pre-planning um, uh, conception um, uh, um, assessment sessions. So the good news is that actually, by and large, endometriosis-associated complications, direct ones, are very rare. 
So therefore, actually, this is the recommendation from ASHRAE, which is our European society, which has re recently published in 2022, the most recent guidelines um, for the management of endometriosis. And it has actually um, um, looked at the evidence around available in the literature. And they have said actually that there is not very concrete evidence that um, uh, uh, there are rare direct complications and it should be interpreted with caution. And currently in our clinical practice, the clinicians are not warranted to increase any antenatal monitoring or dissuade women for becoming pregnant. So basically we can carry on with the individualized care needs. And also it was quite interesting that um, ASHRAE also has published um, in their guideline um, that uh, because the pain symptoms sometimes become better and the symptoms of endometriosis does become better in pregnancy. So the old advice that pregnancy should be advised as a sole purpose to help with the symptoms of endometriosis is no longer recommended um, also um, to make sure that um, women are given informed evidence-based information. So um, let's talk about this thing that what happens to the endometriotic lions during pregnancy? Um, Firstly, I have to admit that there are not many studies around looking particularly to generate a wealth of uh, evidence on this situation. And perhaps um, as part of recommendation of my work in this one is that I will be um, looking at as a group to find out um, in our local center where we work, we are fortunate to have endometriosis accredited one of the 43 centers in the UK at Barking, Havering, Redbridge, and we do deliver a, a, a approximately our annual birth rate is about 8,000 women. Um, so we have got in our, uh, uh, we have got um, a, a population that we can serve better and look at these uh, more prospectively and add the uh, add into the evidence base. What is known at this point is that the behavior of endometriotic lions can be variable, which can be they actually completely disappear during pregnancy or they may well actually increase in their size um, and can grow. Um, although what they have found in this particular study, which, I, um, uh, which has got quite a good um, go, um, a cohort of the population, and it does say in Lena's et al. 2018 study, and that it has got positive impact on symptoms, and there is evidence in this particular study that it reduces the disease progression. Um, um, the, the challenges that you may see during, uh, one may see in pregnancy is that the same lining of the womb cells, which were changing into feeding the baby within the pregnancy inside the womb, may also get changed um, outside the womb uh, if they were located. And those pregnancy hormonal changes in that endometrium, uh, endometriomas, which were outside the womb, can look very atypical on the ultrasounds, and therefore they can pose challenge to the uh, clinicians to differentiate that is this the normal and en en endometriosis changes during pregnancy or is this something sinister going on like malignancy? And in this particular study, there were 60 cases reported of this atypical endometriomas. And in those cases where they investigated and they picked up these findings, they, they monitored these pregnancies very closely. Most of the times they were able to wait and watch and then actually wait after the pregnancy where they saw the resolution of those symptoms and they were clearly able to either remove them and then see under microscope and go from there, uh, confirming that what were these changes, are they innocent or is this something sinister? Um, now, during pregnancy, this was um, if there was a concern that it does look, um, it needs to be taken out. We would, um, we can safely perform minimal access surgery, which is the laparoscopic approach, um, if the pregnancy is caught between uh, is less than 23 weeks. Um, and it, um, it is recommended, which we know that it has to be performed, um, it would be better to perform these surgeries in the center with appropriate expertise where there are multidisciplinary team uh, members available. Accredited centers would have um, uh, these expect expertise uh, because they work regularly with the bowel team, with their clinical psychologist, with their pain management anesthetist and neonatal expertise as well. Um, and of course, the senior gynecologist. Um, okay, so um, I did want to go through the pregnancy and normally as obstetricians, we tend to divide pregnancy in three trimesters. These are the bunch of three, three months. Um, by and large, 
in the first and second trimester, I grouped them together. Um, of course, we know from our general obstetrics um, risk assessments, as well as from our um, you know, midwifery assessments, that as the mom's age increases, there are background increased risk. There can be a um, chance of the chances of getting chromosomal abnormalities, including Down syndrome, they can go high. Um, the risk of miscarriages in general population, now sadly miscarriages are very common, and there is uh, in pregnancies without endometriosis, um, uh, we see that it's um, uh, one in five pregnancies may miscarry. Now this risk is slightly increased if the pregnancy is um, carrying on with endometriosis to one in four. Um, some of you may know already about another complication that can happen in early pregnancy, that can happen in early pregnancies, ectopic pregnancy, where pregnancies can grow um, outside the womb, sometimes in the tube most likely, um, but uh, into different parts of the tube or outside actually in the, around the ovaries or in the tummy. And now um, that risk is slightly increased in pregnancy with endometriosis. It's actually doubled um, as compared to pregnancies without endometriosis, um, which is hypothesized. It is due to the anatomical changes, structural changes that happen with endometriosis. I'm sure we all know from the um, diagnosis of endometriosis that there could be cobweb, a dense or a firm scarring adhesions. Um, and therefore, they wrap things around in a way that the normal structure of the tubes, which is responsible for the transport of um, eggs from the ovaries to the womb, and that can be impaired. Um, and now, the um, so that's why it's very important in, in 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 the early pregnancies if you're experiencing any symptoms of tummy pain or bleeding irregular or not feeling well. Um, and usually this is the advice if there is assisted uh, techniques to help um, someone get pregnant, for example, IVF, IUI, they do explain that the risk is there and therefore um, contact early pregnancy units in your local area um, and um, seek the medical advice. Excessive vomiting in pregnancy, um, and people may be aware that there is a condition, hyperemesis gravidarum, that can happen in any pregnancies. Uh, uh, there is increased risk associated and has been shown with endometriosis. Now, this is um, also interesting, which will come later in this presentation, is that this is not only restricted in the first trimester, uh, because we normally... Generally, what happens is the pregnancy hormones, as they are going up, um, they um, make these, um, uh, they are contributory to um, this excessive vomiting. However, in women with endometri in patients with endometriosis, what happens is that um, because of the scarring, and if there was involvement of the bowel, there are report, uh, case reports where uh, the weakening of the bowel wall or intestinal obstructions have happened, and therefore it can continue, it can be, uh, serious as well at points. Um, it also depends whether this is a singleton pregnancy with one baby or there are more than one, um, which can go on to two or three if this was um, uh, sometimes actually as well as or sometimes with the assisted reproductive techniques. Um, there are some, um, so let's talk about that. What do the endometriomas can do? So endometriomas are the collection of endometrium that has blood and they can be present in the ovaries, yes? Um, in, during pregnancy, they can behave, in, as we talked about earlier on, they can behave in many ways. They can either shrink or disappear or they can increase in size and, or, and they can rupture uh, for which it can cause pelvic pain and it, it looks like an acute emergency. People, or people may be quite a lot of pain and vomiting and not feeling well and those are the signs um, everyone should be able to, with those signs, should be able to attend in our emergency gynecological services and we look after you. Um, they can, there is, a, there is a, a chance of getting pelvic infection, which can happen because of these endometriomas getting infected, or actually because if you had undergone um, associate, um, assisted reproductive techniques and when we were trying to get the egg retrieval or um, procedure to implant uh, the embryos, those can be the uh, predisposing factors to get the pelvic infection. 
or torsion, which can make these ovaries to twist, um, uh, these cysts can twist and can cause significant pain. So these are the uh, important implications that we need to be watching for. Um, ovarian overstimulation, as we know, that assisted reproductive techniques does involve um, stimulation of the ovaries. Sometimes we, uh, we call it ovarian hyperstimulation. It can make the uh, tummy to swell up. It can make pain, it can actually make uh, women, uh, uh, patients quite ill, requiring intensive care admission as well. Um, and uh, there are some statistics in the national data that tells us that I, after IVF, we have got, uh, or, or with assisted reproductive techniques, we've got the live birth rate now 26% um, if the women's age are um, below 38 and 14% for the women of all ages. So with regards to the pain, um, it's, it's hard, but however, what we have seen in our experience, in my experience and in, uh, with my colleagues as well, um, we have seen that it mainly improves. And actually, for some reason, the ladies we have delivered um, a year ago, they do come back actually quite quickly for the second birth. Um, that may be something that we will be talking about as well. Um, uh, However, there are um, others who may suffer from continuing pain or actually their pain worsens. So what happens um, uh, in third trimester? Third trimester is by and large when you have crossed 28 weeks and it is up to term. In our obstetric terms, we define term from 37 completed weeks of pregnancy towards 40 weeks. Um, and anything before 37 weeks is a preterm birth. So um, as I exp explained earlier on that there was a study by Glevin et al. in 2018, and they have reported that these non-specific symptoms of feeling nausea, vomiting, and tummy pains can continue, and they can actually become more prominent, these symptoms, in third trimester, in, in nearer the term, um, leading to these rare complications, um, like um, where the bowels can get away and can rupture, and because of the weakening of the bowel wall, um, and because of the pregnancy hormones impacting these endometriotic lesions, which were different before pregnancy, and during pregnancy, they can actually cause um, uh, when they are causing scarring and uh, they can rupture and also the growing womb um, can cause more trauma to the scarring and therefore um, it, we should be cautious and we should be mindful of these and if you are having any untoward symptoms seek the medical advice timely. Um, there have been rare cases of bladder rupture um, if there was a pre-existing bladder endometriosis, whether we knew it or we didn't. Um, but these are the rare cases that have been reported. Of course, we do worry very much about the uterine rupture uh, during pregnancy um, in, in other situations, because this could be catastrophic um, emergency, both for the mother and the baby. Thankfully, thankfully, these things are rare. Um, and one of the other rare things that actually I came across while doing this preparation for this webinar was this spontaneous hemoperitoneum in pregnancy. I will break it down. Hemo means blood, peritoneum means tummy layer, so the abdominal cavity, basically. Uh, so spontaneous, um, there have been case reports re um, reported um, um, this spontaneous without any trauma, without any surgery, without any known impact on the tummy, but having blood in their uh, in their um, in their tummy. Um, now, uh, while doing this literature review, um, we have had um, uh, one case, and I was going to go back and look at it that uh, where we had uh, one case scenario where um, a lady collapsed after the birth of the baby. And when we tried to find for the any causes um, of blood in the tummy, we couldn't establish um, what was the reason. So this could be something that if they had previous endometriosis, because the vessels and um, these endometriomas can be behind the womb uh, or other lesions as well inside the tummy, um, anywhere uh, on the liver, on the other organs, and they can bleed spontaneously without any cause. So I would suggest actually that in future, this all calls for research in future for us to assess the um, different points that, for example, impact of surg surgery, that what we have done on subsequent pregnancy evolution, how do we stage the disease and what is the disease phenotype? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it um, severe? Is it involving other organs? Is there extra um, um, 
uh, pelvic, which means that outside the womb, outside the ovaries, but other parts of the um, uh, within the abdomen, or actually we have had a rare case, uh, other rare cases of having um, diaphragm, um, uh, having endometriomas in the lungs. Thankfully, thankfully, these are very rare complications I'm talking about here. Nothing to worry, they're not very common. Most commonly we get the good news um, which is um, we look after the pregnancy and they um, have successful outcomes. It's important for the clinicians and uh, for the patients to know what can happen from the baby's perspective, uh, for which we will be offering additional monitoring to if we pick up these, um, uh, uh, if you highlight or we pick up these uh, chances of happening these complications. Um, now, with regards to this particular aspect uh, with the baby, with the new, newborn baby, and how does the placental outcomes, um, the, it is very difficult to draw definitive conclusions from the studies which are available at present. There are associations which they have picked for example, Elani et al. in 2018, once again, they have picked up that they, uh, the pregnancies that are affected by um, endometriosis have got, um, uh, are more likely to have premature labors um, and also premature breaking of water bags. Um, and this was interesting because it was observed in both groups, the ones that conceived naturally, but also assisted reproductive techniques as well. Um, they also have quoted that there's a higher incidence of low-lying placenta. Now, uh, I will explain this, that normally when the pregnancy implants, there's an upper part of the womb and there's a lower part of the womb. The good um, uh, placement of the pregnancy um, is on the upper part and it will develop into the placenta on the top. Lower part is not meant to hold um, at the center. However, uh, we do see even without endometriosis and other conditions, low-lying placenta, and that association is seen in um, endometriosis. The other conditions, medical conditions that uh, can happen in other pregnancies like gestational diabetes or gestational high blood pressure. So it's interesting to note that in small numbers that they have studied in their um, studies, they haven't find, uh, they did not find any definite association with diabetes. However, there is conflicting results for um, hypertension and preeclampsia and Horton et al. did report that there were a little bit higher odds for getting preeclampsia, which is a condition uh, in pregnancy where mom's blood pressure starts going up or they can start losing some proteins um, in urine and it is associated with other symptoms um, like headaches and if they get blurred vision they can get feel dizzy they can have some pain in the upper part of the womb uh, upper part of the stomach um, and this does require close monitoring because it has impact on the baby as well so therefore, I would um, actually, uh, with regards to the labor and delivery, which is the hottest, uh, um, uh, uh, hottest topic, everyone is worried even at the start of the pregnancies. Um, so it is very important. And I had borrowed this um, uh, actually um, high-risk birth plan from our consultant midwives. We've got a couple in our unit and they've been very helpful uh, because they have devised this individualized high-risk birth plan. Um, I've just taken the shot from the, uh, from the top. It has got quite extensive um, uh, sections that goes through all to explore individual needs and individual expectations, their ideas, their worries, their anxieties, how do they wish to deliver, where do they wish to deliver, what support would they need, what, how their birthing partners can help, what is available for pain relief during labor. We do have our um, because um, if, for example, someone had um, complex surgery in the past, um, where they had bowel involvement or they have other medical conditions. It's not that uh, um, if the pregnancy is impacted by endometriosis, they do have other conditions sometimes as well that require consideration. So it's a holistic plan to take everything into account and help with your individualized needs. Um, and there is a, a informed discussion. We use the model, uh, different models. Um, in this particular birth plan that I've shared here, uh, our consultant midwives and our obstetricians and our midwives, when they do the birth plan, uh, they use the informed uh, decision-making sharing, which means that um, what is available, we discuss the benefits, advantages to you, uh, monitoring of the baby, what type of monitoring do we do for mother and the baby, 
um, and if they wish, what choice of the uh, uh, birth choices options, um, cesarean birth or vaginal birth, and if the vaginal birth, what does it mean if require help with the forceps or um, kiwi cups? So these are quite detailed conversations to help you to, uh, to empower both the clinician and the patients to be knowing all this information and feeling um, uh, feeling listened to, supported, because ultimately we would like to go through with this pregnancy experience um, and birth experience um, uh, to gain the uh, to gain the best possible experience. Now, timings of birth. Um, normally, of course, we can wait for the baby and mummy to uh, go into labor, natural labor onset, but sometimes we have to plan the birth of the baby um, earlier than the, your due date or maybe a little bit overdue, um, depending on individual circumstances and actually depending on how the pregnancy has been, how the baby has developed uh, and um, what it means. For place of birth, again, everyone uh, will go through the choices. Um, if you have been well during pregnancy and their um, baby has been growing fine and there are no other risks associated with um, uh, or chances that baby could be small for gestational age or there has been growth issues or um, a, a, the individual risk, then we may have to discuss that hospital birth in delivery suite where both the obstetricians, midwives, anesthetists and neonatal team, which is the baby doctors and the nurses are available. And then it can be dealt in that way. The ones you have delivered, what it means then? Um, are, uh, at Birth. Actually, interestingly, um, in the studies that we have picked up from the ASHRAE Literature Review, it doesn't, it does not show to be increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. However, this was quite interesting for obstetricians. If there has been high risk uh, or increased chances of having bleeding uh, before the birth of the baby, we do know that there is an association after birth as well. Um, so there were two studies that uh, picked up that there is increased risk of having antibottom hemorrhage, and they are probably uh, what they have hypothesized is due to low-lying placenta. And, of course, um, and therefore, we will make arrangements to reduce and prevent the risk by giving you the medication or by discussion, having the conversation, making sure that your iron levels are um, optimized before going into labor, that even um, if the blood loss happens, that we have got the stores in the background. Um, so there is an association um, uh, that uh, when uh, pregnancies with endometriosis, these babies can grow small and um, uh, um, uh, regrettably they are associated with neonatal deaths um, in, in the odd ratio of 1.78. So these numbers are very small and the association is, um, as you can see on the slide. Therefore, um, the recommendation at the moment, and this is what we would, this is what we practice in our uh, clinical domains, is that we need to interpret these um, results with caution. And uh, currently, at the uh, currently, we do have systems to pick up the small for gestation age babies, um, which we will um, do through the risk assessment. At, at booking and as we go along the pregnancy at every antenatal care visit, either with the midwife or the obstetrician, um, we will revisit these uh, risks. And if you are not feeling well in such, uh, or if you are not happy with the baby's movements or there are changes in the symptoms, um, of course, um, we would like you to uh, seek medical help. So um, moving on to what it means that you have delivered, you've gone home with the baby, and you're enjoying there, but you have to think about what, what are my next plans now. Um, uh, and yes, please don't forget that you may fall pregnant very quickly as well. We have seen that in our clinical experience um, that women with endometriosis or with other situations, complex situations, thought that, oh, I took so long to become pregnant in the first uh, sometimes. Uh, and therefore, I may not get pregnant quickly. However, um, they did spontaneously conceive very quickly um, and uh, it's important if you are wanting family spacing use the uh, advice um, and um, use the uh, methods available. Um, we have to be mindful with increasing number of cesareans and more data in literature and pickups of ectopic pregnancy um, which can happen in the cesarean section SPAR, um, which is um, inside the womb. And the reported in literature is about one in 1800, one in 
2016. Um, I would just, um, it's, it's for generic, anyone who have had previous cesarean section, it is about one in 531 um, chance of having a star um, ectopic pregnancy. Um, we're also now seeing abdominal wall endometriosis, and we are trying to report it now better um, because this incidence, which was a little while ago, point, not 0.03 to 0.4%, um, we have seen certainly in our center um, a couple of cases uh, where women were coming, feeling this lump at their cesarean section scar, um, and it will go, uh, it will get better for a couple of weeks in the cycle, but then it will become enlarged and more tender. Um, and it does actually uh, poses us difficulties if it is in different layers of the tummy, that a diagnostic difficulty, as with a general endometriosis. And, and we have done biopsies in the past to find out what was it um, and once confirmed, um, our team has actually advanced, um, uh, team members have um, killed it and removed it surgically. So as uh, you, um, uh, you are aware that we are centered, so I've asked my, um, I requested my clinical psychologist colleague to give us some um, uh, tips and some resources that what is available for self-management and support for you to go on to um, uh, certain um, resources um, and she has given me this list, which is quite interesting. Um, it has got the mix. Um, some are available through NHS in form. Some are the guides that you can go and I, I, uh, some of you might be aware or using um, Calm um, app already. Um, the ones that I found, um, there are others on, available on Endometriosis UK website in itself, actually, which was very helpful. Um, but um, our clinical psychologist has also referred this one particularly, which is um, Julia Samuel's grief workshop, um, because in, uh, she was wanting me to, she was happy for me to share um, this, um, that she, in her experience, she feels um, she has collected the data and there is some evidence that 50%, about half of the women with endometriosis may have some sort of trauma, either post-traumatic stress disorder or pregnancy changes or um, difficulties or challenges. And this Grief Works app um, has worked well for, um, uh, for women uh, for those times. Um, okay, so... Um, Put that okay, let's make it a little bit more um, real. So this is one of the case study um, uh, that one of our um, patients had finally allowed us and she has actually provided us a bit of blog and helped us to find out what our recommend, what will be her recommendations for improvements in the care um, during pregnancy and after pregnancy. So this is, um, she was happy for me to share. Um, uh, she actually had long journey, like uh, quite a lot we know from endometriosis, um, um, uh, literature review that women have to wait quite a long time for this diagnosis and help with their symptoms. Um, however, our COG and other organizations like Endometriosis UK and such webinars to raise the awareness both amongst general population as well as the clinicians um, how to um, uh, help with this long gap in terms of diagnosis. Um, so she also had to wait for seven years um, and then during this time she was trying. She had undergone two complex surgeries. Um, at different centers, some near to where she lived, somewhere, some she had to travel, uh, which is important because it has implications for the um, working women um, and with any um, a situation where they have to organize their care far from home. Um, and she also had the comorbidity of Crohn's disease. I'm not sure whether everyone is aware. This is one of the inflammatory bowel disease that can happen. Um, she did develop gestational diabetes. So. Um, at 26 weeks, um, started with diet control, went through, 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 but later on in pregnancy, she did require insulin injections. And then she delivered a bundle of joy baby girl, we call her bundle of joy all the time, um, to cesarean birth. And both mom and baby are doing well and enjoying. Um, and when we put this question to her that, uh, if there are a couple of things that you would like us to um, help um, improve our, um, local provision of the care um, and she said because she was having comorbidity of Crohn's disease she was 
um, having some symptoms from them, uh, from that disease. And therefore she was under gastroenterologist for her. She was under the fertility specialist and she was under the obstetricians and she was under the gynecologist um, and, and gestational diabetes would have meant she was under the uh, consultant endocrinologist and the whole team of Medifri and obstet obstetricians in that part. So basically, he would say that if we could make her journey a bit seamless by making more joint of care um, through fertility, through pregnancy care, through other things like gastroenteritis, um, and uh, that would help um, improve her um, and perhaps the experience of every of those uh, women who do suffer from uh, these situations. Um, she did mention particularly positively about the support that she had the, at workplace because the colleagues were supportive, the team was supportive for, uh, supportive for her uh, to be able to attend these multiple appointments at different points. Um, and having the local unit would have meant that she, uh, where she was working, being a staff as well as to be cared for, um, has meant that she didn't have to take quite a long time off to travel around and she could accommodate those appointments at the, at the same site, if you uh, understand what I mean. Okay, I think that brings us to the, to the end of my slides. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope um, it was um, clear, it was succinct. And I let um, we all go back to Endometriosis UK to guide us through and have your questions, perspectives and some discussion points. Um, thank you so much for listening to me for that long. I know it's not easy. <laughs> it was very easy, Asma. It was really interesting. And um, in the, um, the Q&A function, there's like, um, a couple of messages that said thank you. Um, I, my first um, question is, can endometriosis cause a more painful or more complicated labour? Um, so yes and no, but it is individualized. We do know that pain um, can be uh, uh, can worsen. Um, it can, and the labor pains are painful. Uh, on the top, if there were any background um, reasons um, for um, pain, for example, as we talked about, if there were any complications of the previous surgery, which can cause scarring, if endometriosis was severe, uh, if it has involved the bladder or the bowel, um, that stretching and scarring and um, bleeding into those can cause more pain. Complicated labor, yes, because, um, because of the surgeries within the womb or outside the womb, and again, the fertility positions, if there's a low lying placenta, baby can be head down or baby can be bump, um, head up. And those positions of the babies, as well as where the placenta is lying, these are the complications that can happen. And there, uh, we, we have um, actually in the literature, there is evidence that these labors have to be monitored very closely. Baby has to be monitored um, throughout the labor. In, in the situations to pick up if the baby was getting distressed and we could um, easily resolve the cesarean birth. Okay. Um, I hope it uh, no, definitely. Thank you. And um, my next question is going to be from the live QA. Um, so, why is an endometriosis considered as a high risk pregnancy in the NHS? So after doing this webinar, I would suggest, and yes, we are all cautious of these. I suppose where we, we do consider high-risk pregnancy if it has shown us, for example, if, uh, if there were um, surgical co complications, if there are risk factors with maternal age. So they would automatically um, uh, come because of the pregnancy related risk factors. So if the age was more than 35 or more than 40, then it is considered as a high risk pregnancy. But I do agree that actually after reading all this and with these, all these risks that have been picked up, um, that it hasn't actually come as a high risk pregnancy trigger. Um, and we have to individualize. We are still dependent on women telling us the history of their confirmed diagnosis, and then the clinicians picking up the risk um, throughout with individual contacts. Um, and that's the food for thought. Um, at the moment, it isn't as such triggers, but it is certainly there. Previous surgical complications is the question asked to every woman who's booking in 
uh, and previous uh, procedures or medical problems. So if they are diagnosed as endometriosis, we'll keep those points in, in, in assessment. Okay, thank you so much, Asma. And so during the early stages of pregnancy, should there be more close monitoring to ensure the egg is not stuck in the fallopian tube? Yes. So as we have already in, um, understood from the presentation that ectopic pregnancy, which is when the egg can get stuck, it's called ectopic pregnancy in the tube. And because of the risk is doubled, um, um, endometriosis uh, is a predisposing risk factor. Therefore, um, uh, the any symptoms, so women would be warned if they were, will be having any symptoms untoward of abdominal, of tummy pains, bleeding, or feeling dizzy. It's not universally routine at the moment, universal routine at the moment to screen everyone uh, because um, uh, we don't have really numbers needed to treat, uh, which at the moment with these current studies, and that might be something that we need to look at and that certainly when there is a tubal surgery performed before or if there were fertility investigations that has picked up higher risk factors, um, assisted reproductive techniques, I am aware that they do, uh, when they implant the eggs um, or embryos back, they do perform scans uh, to, to check if there is any earlier signs that this pregnancy is not in the right place. But it's not universal at the moment. And we are again reliant on the women to tell us about the symptoms and present to the early pregnancy units. Thank you. And, and so what are the risks of pregnancy when an endometrioma in the ovary is present, such as um, increased risk of rupture or complications? So the current advice from our literature is that if the endometrioma is four centimeters and above, and if some, uh, and when the couples are planning to get pregnant, that if the endometrioma is above or equal to four centimeters, that, that needs to be removed perhaps before getting pregnant. Now, if it has increased in pregnancy, again, we have discussed, and if it is rupturing and it is showing the signs, and then of course we have to um, help. Uh, so some of them, if they were small rupture and not bleeding extensively, or um, then we can, so they do need closer monitoring within the hospital setting at the times, because we need to observe the pattern evolution of the symptoms. And if need be, we need to take to theater and help to, um, uh, to remove it. Yeah. Thank you. And do you have to have a laparoscopy before you try um, for a baby with endometriosis? And is there a cutoff age for those with endometriosis to have a baby? Oh, okay. It has got two parts, is it? So let's go from the first part, uh, because I might have forgotten the second part by the time I finish the first part, so you might have to repeat. So the first part is, do we have to have laparoscopy before we embark on the journey? No, not, not always. It is very much dependent on your, um, uh, on your symptoms. It is very much dependent on whether um, uh, what imaging has been and also um, how the fertility has become an issue because we don't know how many pregnancies have been conceived actually with endometriosis because they never got a problem and they never presented to us as gynecologists. So therefore it's not always no. Um, and the second part was, Emma, repeat it, please. So it was, and is there a cut of age for those with endometriosis to have a baby? Ah, okay. So age in general for us women, as we have come in with not an indefinite number of eggs, we have got this um, situation that after the age of 40 or between 37 um, onwards, the, these number of the eggs and the quality of eggs in the ovaries uh, do start decreasing at, a, um, at an exponential rate. So therefore, it's not a cutoff. It's making sure that we are aware of that maternal age impact on our ovarian reserve um, and of course the quality of eggs to become pregnant. And also um, we know that as the increasing maternal mom's age increases, um, there is increased risk of comorbidities like high blood pressure or um, cardiac problems or um, diabetes as well set in or other medical problems like connective tissue disorders. Um, and uh, the chromosomal abnormalities risk goes up. Um, so those things, but in terms of the endometriosis, by, by and large, by its own 
um, situation, there is no cutoff, uh, but it does impact um, how the disease, um, it does impact how the disease has already influenced the ovaries. So perhaps earlier reproductive age group. Um, yeah, I think there is no restriction as far as I can see from the, uh, from the literature. Um, so why would someone's endometriosis get worse during pregnancy? And I think you've already covered, well, covered yeah. some of it. Yeah, uh, 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 pregnancy hormones, which are working at uh, inside the womb, and as the tummy is growing, the womb is getting bigger because of that stretching, because of that um, scarring, and also before endometriosis may be small if it is increasing in size during pregnancy, um, which is not most of the cases that I have seen, or um, which is good, and that's why I think we should follow it more regularly now, proactively in future to be able to answer these questions a bit better if it's supported by good, robust evidence. At the moment, we lack that. You got muted, Emma. Oh, sorry. Um, so this, this is my next question. You might not have um, enough research for as well, but I'm going to ask it. <laughs> so what is the effect of adenomyosis with pregnancy? Um, yeah, so adenomyosis is another condition coexistent sometimes with endometriosis. It is a difficult situation because adenomyosis is right behind the, uh, the lining of the womb is the uh, muscle layer. Um, and again, it depends how was it diagnosed before and what treatment options have been done. Because if there were big chunks of the womb, muscle which have been taken to help with adenomyosis symptoms, which is uh, sometimes required to help with symptoms of the women, uh, that would mean that that area could be weakened in the womb and therefore slightly increasing the risk of rupture, slightly increasing for the placenta to grow in that area as well. So we do see morbidly adherent placenta, which is again, uh, was not mentioned in this literature review, which is the most updated one in 2022, which might be something, another thing that we need to further see, because we have certainly come across if someone have had uh, morbidly adhered placenta, um, uh, that there were previous history of some uterine surgery, and we are seeing that um, association. So again, the risk of miscarriage will be there, ectopic pregnancy chances will be there, um, and low-lying placenta, uh, and therefore uh, the, this pregnancy needs to be monitored and being counseled appropriately at the start with the risk assessment. Thank you. Um, and so what is the, oh, what are the pain management options for people whose pains get worse during pregnancy? Uh, thank you so much for asking because I did forget that, that I actually managed to speak, um, I had uh, input from my obstetric anesthetist colleagues and actually our pain management consultant who is a very good colleague who sits with our endometriosis center team um, and leads on that uh, particular part of uh, pain management. Um, and what they have told me, of course, our experience has been that all the pain options are there for you as much as in the general population, which includes the injection in the bum, um, pathogen, opioids as well. So it's a step ladder pattern they use. Um, they, there is tense machines that are available to use during labor as well, um, which use the stimulation to the, uh, uh, to, you can put it, uh, they are available on rents as well, um, and they help with early parts of labor. Of course, epidurals, which are injection in the back, the regional uh, blocks are available for that. Um, they did discuss about that if there is endometriosis and there have been previous surgery and the duration of cesarean section, uh, which we perform normally, uh, of course, um, everyone is individual, but if it is a procedure, usually about 45 minutes, 30 minutes to, a mi uh, to an hour, but with endometriosis, if they have had previous surgery, so the length of the procedure, operating procedure can be long, um, which means that they may want to, uh, anesthetist will discuss with you what are the types of energy anesthesia and anesthesia are available. And um, of course they did, um, we did, we are aware that opioids like morphine, like codeine, 
And when they are used after birth, they small amount does get secreted in the breast milk and it can cause babies to be drowsy and there are techniques. So we, and the other option, and therefore there will be alternatives to think about which are compatible, uh, but actually anything which is available in the general population is available to you as well. And they will be more considerate. So when, you, when anyone gets the individualized birth plan, there is a full section on pain relief in labor. And there is actually a very good um, information leaflet as well available on Tommy's website, um, resources that you can go through and have your own thoughts. Water birth, again, water birth is available. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And so, my next question. Yeah, Emma, I did see someone raise hands. Of course, I uh, I can only see me and you. <laughs> oh, that's okay. It, it lowered. Um, okay, they, they answered your her. things. Okay, good. Yeah, so I think they might have um, submitted a question instead, but that's okay, don't worry. <laughs> I've got it. You're, um, you've got all in under control. Okay, that's good then. <laughs> so, um, my next question is, is there any association between having endometriosis and having a baby with chromosome, mm, chromosomal abnormal, abnormalities? abnormalities. Yeah. Um, so, um, we did talk about it, isn't it, that if it is a maternal age, which is in the brackets of those which are increased risk with chromosomal abnormalities, it's quite interesting. And also the medication. So we were, um, uh, it is quite, uh, it is important that if you are planning pregnancy and you are on the medication to try to get pregnant and uh, that you are using um, uh, or in the time leading up to the pregnancy that you are not on any medications which has impact on the on the baby. They are called teratogenic medications. Um, otherwise, in itself, endometriosis hasn't shown a direct link um, to cause any chromosomal abnormality. There is, of course, if uh, there is previous incidents, previous miscarriage and previous uh, obstetric history that tells us that there is a chromosomal abnormality. That's we know that there is a recurrence. Um, but from the literature that I have reviewed, they haven't been able to directly link it. Um, it is due to the other factors which are involved um, as we have gone through them. Thank you. And how do you prepare for a pregnancy with endometriosis? Okay, so this is a very interesting question. Um, the, the, uh, as an obstetrician, we would like the pregnancies to be having a preconception counseling. Um, as part of my obstetric work, I do look after women with medical disorders um, like diabetes, like hypertension, like connective tissue problems. And we do request, um, we do at the moment does not have a very succinct preconception clinics. Um, which provides all this information, what to expect, how to prepare, what would be good, where the general information about good pregnancy, for example, diet, for example, vitamins replacement or some uh, supplements or what is required in individualized care. So the, the best way forward would be um, to have your um, discussion with your GP. If you are planning pregnancy, um, have a discussion with the midwives when you are booking, or when you, or your general, um, or fertility specialists. Some of our fertility specialists also do obstetric practices, so therefore they they are usually well placed. And what I'm aware that most of the fertility units, if they are investigating, will have access to the endometriosis team and where they work collaboratively. And those will be the way forward as well to have preconception um, discussions, counseling, information sharing, and better prepare. I hope it helps. And so how long after removing um, endometriosis can you try for pregnancy? Okay, so that is quite um, interesting because there is more and more evidence coming through it that um, if the women, uh, if the patient desires fertility when they are having surgical treatment, um, then usually as quickly as three months. And actually, one of the other case study that I um, had, um, um, I had uh, uh, actually worked around with endometriosis UK was. Um, where uh, they had the surgical treatment for bilateral endometriomas and they conceived uh, within the three months and that pregnancy was um, 
can continued and had a good outcome. Um, so if, the, uh, if there is a desire for fertility, the surgical management at the moment is that you, uh, the ASHRAE guideline does recommend that after the surgical management, you can try for pregnancy within three months. But it does depend what type of surgery was it as well and how you have recovered from that and were there any complications and what is the advice of the gynecologist and the team that has done your surgery as well. So I will request to follow their advice because that will be more individualized and personalized um, and it will be evidence-based. Thank you. And does a higher stage um, of endometriosis increase the risk during pregnancy? So these are interesting questions because at the moment there's quite a lot of debate about staging of the disease and staging of the disease and its, uh, um, its link with the symptoms. Um, so uh, uh, actually the evidence is that at the moment, apart from severe endometriosis where there have been bowel and um, bladder involvement or deep infiltrating endometriosis, which has got um, uh, uh, more risk associated with in pregnancy, mild to moderate have been shown to cause is is not is not as a problem. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. I'll make this my last question. Um, so, how actually? Um, so so can induction medicines impact endometriosis? Sorry, what did you say? Sorry, can you repeat me? Pardon me. Can induction medicines impact endometriosis? Induction for labor. Ah, okay, okay. So this is quite, um, again, an interesting question. Thank you. Induction management uh, uh, medication are mainly prostaglandins. Um, and they are there to help to ripen the neck of the womb and to prepare to go into starting labor. And again, this has not been actually looked at the literature at all up to this point. What we know from our clinical experience is that because the focus at the time from the women and the clinician is to get delivery, um, it, uh, but this would be again, make a good interesting research point for future, um, we haven't seen in particular, um, we do know that induction agents can be associated with, uh, there is a small risk of womb working too much like hyperstimulation or um, a risk of uterine rupture with that. Now, uh, practically speaking, given the uterine rupture can happen spontaneously in women with ad ad adenomyosis or endometriosis. So there may be an association, it hasn't been looked at, um, and this is actually just from the clinical experience that there is theoretical, there may be a theoretical risk here um, and we may have to be more cautious. We do know that we are cautious with uh, induction agents use if there is previous uterine surgery, like scarred uterises, um, and uh, some of the units in the UK may not use any medi medicinal method. They may use or prefer mechanical methods for induction um, if, uh, uh, to be better with scar due to, to reduce the ris risk of um, hyperstimulation and uterine rupture. Thank you.